In this video, we're primarily interested in characterizing disaccharides. Now, we've looked at three structures of disaccharides already, but I want you to imagine that we are looking at a disaccharide whose structure we don't know, and we'd like to elucidate it experimentally. In this video, we're going to look at a series of experiments and observations that can allow us to determine the nature of the glycosidic linkage and the sugars involved using some selective chemical reactions. And first, we're going to look at reducing versus non-reducing sugars. So the concept here has to do with the ability of a sugar to reduce silver plus to silver metal or not. And to begin exploring this, I actually want us to start with maltose, the structure on the left. Maltose contains a hemiacetal functional group. This structure can open to form an aldehyde, and it does this reversibly. It's not the most favorable form of the disaccharide, but it can do this to a small extent to form just a little bit of an aldehyde. That aldehyde can be oxidized. In particular, when we take this disaccharide, when we take maltose and we dissolve it in water with a little bit of silver plus cation, we end up oxidizing the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, and at the same time, we reduce the silver plus to silver metal, or silver zero which actually plates out onto the reaction flask as a silver mirror, as a beautiful layer of silver metal. Because the aldehyde found within maltose in the open form of this particular monosaccharide within the maltose structure is capable of undergoing oxidation by silver plus, maltose is called a reducing sugar. Now this terminology gets a little bit confusing because we just talked about oxidation, right? We just talked about oxidation of the aldehyde. But in undergoing oxidation, this aldehyde, which is part of the disaccharide, is facilitating the reduction of silver plus to silver metal. And so because this Ag plus to Ag zero is a reduction process, the sugar is referred to as reducing. Put another way, it's able to act as a reducing agent which is why we call it reducing. And ultimately, the reducing behavior of maltose stems from its ability to form a hemiacetal, at least to a small extent, when dissolved in water. This free hemiacetal is key to the reducing ability of maltose. Now let's look at the other sugars that we had on the last slide. And let's begin with sucrose. Now, in looking for hemiacetals within the structure of, the, of sucrose, we should really focus on the anomeric carbons, these carbons with two bonds to oxygen. And if we look within the glucose unit, we see that the anomeric carbon in glucose within the sucrose structure is part of an acetal, not a hemiacetal. And if we look at the fructose unit, we again see that the anomeric carbon is part of an acetal, not a hemiacetal. In fact, the structure of sucrose lacks a hemiacetal. For this reason, the disaccharide is unable to open at any point anywhere in its structure to form an aldehyde. There's no way we can get a carbonyl group from this structure when it's dissolved in, say, aqueous solution. Without the ability to form an aldehyde, even reversibly because there's no hemiacetal in the structure, sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. This means that if we try to repeat the same experiment, dissolve sucrose in water and then add silver plus and see if silver metal plates out, we would not observe the plating out of silver metal. In fact, that solution would just sit and do absolutely nothing. Now, if we look finally at lactose, which was the last of the three sugars we explored on the last slide, we see that like maltose, lactose does contain a hemiacetal within its structure. One of the disaccharide units is involved in the glycosidic linkage through carbon-4. That means carbon-1 is free, quote-unquote, to form a hemiacetal in lactose and in maltose, in fact. That hemiacetal can open to form an aldehyde, and that aldehyde can be oxidized. And that means that lactose can act as a reducing agent. It's a reducing sugar. Making this distinction between reducing and non-reducing is actually quite useful. In particular, if we can identify a sugar as non-reducing, we can come to the immediate conclusion that its glycosidic linkage consists of a linkage between two anomeric carbons. In sucrose, both anomeric carbons are involved in the glycosidic linkage. 
This has the effect that both are part of acetals. There are no free hemiacetals in this structure because the two carbons involved in the glycosidic linkage are anomeric carbons. The experimental observation that a sugar is non-reducing allows us to draw this conclusion that two anomeric carbons are involved in the glycosidic linkage. And if we can determine the monomer units by other means, which we'll explore in the next slide, this allows us to immediately draw the structure of the disaccharide with everything about its structure there, with the exception of the stereochemistry of the glycosidic linkage, which we're not going to worry about in this course.